Recording in progress. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so we had hopefully, hopefully the lectures from the last two days were not that bad. I know they were old lectures. I had attempted to, I, I had started recording uh, new lectures, but then I just ran out of time. So I said, okay, well, it's, it's all right. It'll be good enough. Um, so, but you sort of win, you sort of luck out because some of the homework questions were addressed in those lectures. So yeah, it's a win-win for everybody. So with that being said, let's go ahead. I know that it had sort of ended on problem nine, um, but I figured that we would, we would just kind of go over that, um, finish it and start it. So kind of very quickly, I know we had gotten part of the way done but all right so we have a square 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter silicon chip so and the area of this thing is what 0 0.01 meters by 0 0.01 meters uh, it's insulated on one side and then it's cooled on the other uh, so let's see so this is I've got things coming in so U infinity, 20 meters per second. And then I have a free stream temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. And then it says when in use, electrical power dissipation within the chip maintains a uniform heat flux. So this is actually a little bit different. Um, this is a little bit different scenario. Is it? There it is. A uniform command. Okay. Here we go. No, it's just not one to show up. Okay. That's okay. So it's a uniform heat flux as opposed to everything up until this point, which has been a constant surface temperature. And so actually I need to pull up my, um, pull up my equation sheet here, I believe. Let me do that right now. Uh, yes, this one. Yeah, this is a little bit different. So if I look at table 7.7, .7, what I see at the very bottom, so it's like it's sort of hidden, and I do pre apologize for that, but down at this little wording right here. So we're looking at, this is uh, page 5 of that heat transfer packet. It's table 7.7 .7, or with reference to table 7.7, .7, all those convection heat transfer relations, relationships, empirical relationships. Um, and they are all for the case of a constant temperature surface of that flat plate. We don't actually have that condition. We've got a constant heat flux. So it's a little bit different. And so that equation is not here. I'm going to give you that equation, but it is in your textbook. Um, and then I've got a little, little verbiage in here. If you have the condition of a constant surface heat flux, the required equations will be given to you to calculate the new salt number. Um, and so hopefully that will maybe alleviate your mind a little bit about um, well, what if I have one of these problems and actually it would be even easier because then you really don't have to do too much work about figuring out what equation to use right it's kind of indicated this is the equation for you all right 
So the chip surface, I'll just say that the maximum temp temperature is 80 degrees along this the surface, the surface length. And we want to know what the maximum allowable power is. Um, and then there's a, another sentence here about an unstarted heating length. And we're going to just not even worry about that guy. We're going to cross that out. Um, it's not really it, not really much more difficult. Uh, it's just another empirical relationship, but we're, we've got enough to deal with right now. So we're going to not not worry about unstarted heating lengths. OK, so I needed to find the maximum allowable power. And probably, yeah. So I think mostly where we had gotten to in the last lecture was by applying our energy balance, right? So this is just an energy balance. Uh, in the form of your first law of thermo. So this may or may not look familiar to you, but you have, if you apply it, and this is applied to, to the chip itself. So I have Q minus W equals delta U plus delta kinetic energy plus delta potential energy for a given time period. Um, it's not really that difficult to figure, well, I'm going to ignore this kinetic and potential energy changes for the chip that's just sitting there. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get rid of that. So I got a delta kinetic energy, delta potential energy. Those things are gone. Um, and then another thing is if this chip, now what we're going to see is that um, the temperature is not constant along the length of the plate. We have a constant heat flux, but the surface temperature is not constant. Um, but that's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say delta U is zero because for the for the chip itself, because the average temperature of that chip is just zero or not zero, the delta. <laughs> I'm sorry, the change in the average temperature. Right, so the average temperature of that chip is not cool, it is not changing because we're we have a constant heat flux being removed from the surface. All right, and so what that's going to give us is that Q is equal to W, and then I'm going to put things in terms of rates. So I'm going to put a little note, I'm going to put it in terms of rates. And then the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'll say, and use the, I guess, the nomenclature for, uh, for Q, like we do in this class, like we do here in this class. Okay, so instead of writing Q dot for the heat transfer rate, we're going to write just little q. That's our heat transfer rate. All right. So with that being said, perfect. So I've got this constant heat flux. So now I want to figure, okay, so I'm going to apply Newton's law of cooling. So I know that Q is equal to H times the area um, times, and that's the surface area, right? So it's this area right here, the 0 0.01 meters times 0 0.01 meters um, times my surface temperature minus uh, T infinity. And so the question really is, well, where along the surface is the temperature the highest? 
So where is TS equal to the maximum temperature? Because that's our limiting factor. In other words, is it at X equals zero? Or is it X equals L? Or maybe something in between? It's probably one or the other. So we have to kind of think about it. Well, I know. I know that the heat flux is constant, so it doesn't matter where I'm looking at along the length of that plate. It's a constant value. I also know, well, I also know that this is equal to H, the local heat transfer coefficient. So local heat transfer coefficient. Actually, I'm going to put that here. This is the local heat transfer coefficient at a particular uh, location, right? Times um, TS minus T infinity. So I know that that's a constant. TS will be a maximum where that convective heat transfer coefficient is a minimum, right? So again, the reason that is, is because I know that that heat flux, that Q double prime has to be a constant. So, well, if that, the bigger that this TS is, the bigger the delta T in the brackets there, and the smaller that H is. So TS is gonna be a maximum where, where that H is a, is a minimum. And conversely, well, wherever this guy is a maximum, this guy is gonna be at a minimum. So that's my, that's my thought process. Okay. Oh. Okay. So let's look at that local heat transfer coefficient. I won't say look at, let's, let's calculate that local heat transfer coefficient. All right, so the first thing that I need to do is I need to figure out, do we have laminar or turbulent flow? Because there will be a, there will be a, uh, uh, a, a, value calculated for the Nusselt number. This is what that's related to, right? So there, your, your convective heat transfer coefficient is related to the dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. So this is our Nusselt number at a particular location X times uh, your thermal conductivity of your fluid divided by whatever location X you're talking about. So that Nusselt number again will be different if it's laminar or turbulent. So let's calculate our, our Reynolds number. So our Reynolds number, um, and we're gonna calculate it at X equals L because if it's if it turns out that it's, um, that it's laminar at X equals L, then it's laminar across the whole thing. Because one of the things we're always going to assume is that it's laminar flow coming in the, the whole length of, or coming in um, at X equals zero. All right, so or at x equals l, this is going to be u infinity times, um, and then we're going to have our l over our kinematic viscosity. And let's see, do I have that? Let's see if that's given to us. Kind of make this a little smaller. We don't have it, but I tell you what, I'm going to give it to you. So our properties for air. And by the way, you know, 
very likely on a test. I'm going to give you those values, but in reality, you would calculate those. Normally, you would calculate them at the film temperature, which is the average of T infinity and the surface temperature. Oh, did somebody say something? Oh, maybe not. Okay. Uh, here, the surface temperature is different at different locations, so I would probably just suggest doing it the average of the maximum temperature in T infinity, but um, regardless, let's go ahead and get those properties. So I've got these, so our kinematic viscosity, I've got 18.41 times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared per second. I have a thermal conductivity um, and I'll put a little F to indicate that it's for the fluid. It doesn't matter about the chip, or at least not for this problem. This is 0 0.0282 watts per meter Kelvin. And then we do need one more thing. We'll be needing our Prandtl number 0 0.703. If you've got air, typically just saying that it's 0.7 is probably going to get you close enough, just in reality. All right, perfect. So I've got those properties, so I have enough information to calculate what my Reynolds number is. Um, so I'm going to plug, plug my viscosity, my uh, kinematic viscosity, into my Reynolds number equation. I've again, I've got U infinity. That's the 20 meters per second. I end up getting a value of 10,864. So this guy, my Reynolds number at X equals L, looks like it's less than 10 to the fifth, which is the critical, that's the critical Reynolds number where that transition, that where we're saying that transition to turbulence occurs. Of course, it's a kind of a range of values. It doesn't immediately uh, undergo that transition. There's a range of values that that occurs with. Um, so, but we can say wonderful. It's laminar. Laminar flow. Perfect. And so in your book, you do have an equation and it's for laminar flow. constant heat flux. Perfect. Oops, I'm sorry. I think I'll need myself another piece of paper here. That one. Perfect. So in your book, this equation is, uh, let's see. Be nice to have like a something. Ah, perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. Do different liquids have different Reynolds ranges for laminar and turbulent flow? So it's not a matter of like different. I remember in fluids, turbulent flow was about any value above 2100. Um, so, oh, uh, I think what you're thinking about is internal flow. So with the, yeah, for Reynolds number 2100, we're going to use 2300 for internal flow for the transition to turbulence. But again, you'll see in different textbooks, you'll see a diff, you may see different values for that cutoff. Um, typically, typically it's 10 to the fifth for, um, for flow over a flat plate, but again, you may see different different values because it's not like, well, as soon as we hit a Reynolds number of 10 to the fifth, it immediately transitions to turbulence. There's a, there's a transition range. Um, okay, so for laminar flow, Q double prime is constant. Um, we have a new salt number, local new salt number, and we're gonna actually put it as any X, right? going to be equal to 0 0.453 times our Reynolds number to the one half times our Prandtl number to the one third. Um, and by the way, this is, I do have an equation number if you're curious. This is equation 6.45.
perfect. All right. So what I want to look at now is okay. I, now I can calculate what that H is. So this is going to be my my local new salt number. So I have 0 0.453. And while I do know what that Reynolds number is, I have a value for that. I'm not going to plug it in quite yet because I want to look at how that H value changes along the length. So I'm going to keep it in terms of U infinity times, and I'm not going to put it as L, but I'm going to put it as X because I'm just looking, oops, there we go. I'm looking at any particular location. This is going to be squared. Oh, actually divided by thing that looks like specific volume that's my viscosity or my kinematic viscosity all right so that's my Reynolds number squared times my Prandtl number to the one-third all right so what I'm gonna end up getting I'm gonna actually bring it down here what I'm gonna end up getting I'm gonna have basically a whole bunch of terms that's just a constant so 0 0.453 times u infinity squared uh, times our Prandtl number to the one third over my kinematic viscosity. Uh, this will also be squared. Um, oh, and I'm sorry what I did there. This whole thing right here is my Neusselt number. But I have some other parts of that equation that I was conveniently leaving out. Kf, and then all of this is divided by x. So I actually also have a Kf here. And then I'm going to have what? Oh, and it's not squared. Ah, yes. Anna, thank you so much. I was going to get there, <laughs> but I was getting there too slowly. Yes. This should be to the one half. So let's make this fix that. Fix this. Those should be to the one half. Half. All right. So then I have x to the one half over x, which will be x to the negative one half. So this is just some constant. And so what I'm trying to draw our attention to, I know it seems like, what are we doing? Well, what I'm trying to draw your attention to is where is that H value gonna be the smallest? Because as you recall, we're trying to figure out, okay, well, where is that TXS? What location is TS going to be a maximum? It's going to be a maximum where that HX is at a minimum. So let's go ahead and see where that's going to be. So if we think about what that X to the negative one half looks like, it's going to go like this. It's going to go down, right? So so HX will be a minimum at X equals L. And so TS will be maximum at X equals L. Okay. Whew. All right. So back to calculating uh, our Q. So this is q and by the way that q it's that we're trying to get remember this is we said okay w dot is equal to q and q is equal to q double prime times our surface area right and so what i'm doing is i'm going to define that q double prime at a particular location um so it's going to be uh h the local heat transfer coefficient at a particular location in this case it's going to be at x equals l because i know that's where the ts is going to be at a uh, maximum um, and of course i've got that surface area so I might as well put him in there times our ts 
where it's going to be a maximum, which is at x equals l minus t infinity. So now we're getting somewhere. Um, I do actually have a value for this. So if I plugged in x equals l, I end up getting, this ends up being 118 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Okay. All right, so this guy, 80 degrees, that's the maximum surface temperature allowed. This guy is the 24 degrees Celsius. And so if I plug all those things in, I should get a value of 0. Uh, yeah, 0. 0.66 watts, and that's the that W dot max. Perfect. I think that was, yeah, that was it that we, that we needed for that guy. All right. So the next thing that we're going to talk about, we're going to move on to internal flow. So internal flow, pipe flow. And we're only going to be worrying about circular pipes, although your book talks about, or should talk about, they should talk about um, ways to deal with pipes that don't have a, cir a circular cross-sectional area. If they don't, what you'll use instead of D is something called the hydraulic diameter. Um, but again, the only problems that we're going to be working are just going to be cylindrical pipes. All right, so with internal flow, that somebody said some. All right, so with internal flow, we've got a couple of considerations. We have hydrodynamic considerations. All right, so here's our pipe. And we'll have flow coming in. Let's make this little bit darker. So we'll have flow coming in. And it's going to have some velocity u. Um, and as soon as it hits that surface, of course, we're going to start to see a boundary layer formation. But of course, we're going to see that happen all the way around it, right? It's a cylinder, right? And at some point, those, that boundary layer is going to converge. And the place where that occurs is where we say that we are fully developed hydrodynamically. And we have two equations. We have an equation, and I'm going to kind of scroll down just a little bit on our equation sheet. So this is page six. And you'll see we've got, OK, internal flow through circular tubes circular tubes, maybe cylindrical tubes would have been, I guess, tubes of, with a circular cross section. Um, but you have this equation right here. So this is where the flow would become fully developed hydrodynamically if we had laminar flow. And if it's turbulent flow, the equation's even a little bit easier. So that's perfect. So that's hydrodynamic um, we'll subscript H, we'll talk about uh, what it means to become fully developed or, uh, thermally, uh, and that's the little subscript T here, but we're going to just worry about the hydrodynamic first. Okay, so anywhere past that, your velocity profile is going to be, it'll look like this. I was trying to make it so it was like right there. <laughs> so starting right there. Well, there we go. There's my velocity profile. Looks like this. So in a pipe with a circular cross section, it's going to look like a parabolic um, profile. And you'll notice that I said that it's a function of R. 
not x because it doesn't really matter if I look right where that transition occurs right to fully develop flow or if I look you know 50 meters down the line it doesn't matter it's the same profile and so we say that it is fully developed if that velocity profile isn't changing all right so let me write something before I write that so when you figure out where is that where is that transition where does it become fully developed you need to ask yourself um, so I'll say X that location depends on whether the flow is laminar or turbulent Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, and we've got equations for where that occurs, if it's laminar or turbulent on your equation sheet. Um, if it's fully developed, it's fully developed flow if, um, most importantly, we do talk about velocity like in the radial direction, um, and that is true. So, right, your velocity in the radial direction is equal to zero. So, radial direction. We use u as the velocity component in the x direction. So, okay, great, that is what it is, but then also that Your velocity profile with respect to X in the X direction so you this guy is zero all that means again is that it's not changing as it goes down the line once it's fully developed so that's that's pretty good um, note that typically we don't really care about you know the the variation of u as a function of r so typically we only deal with the mean velocity so mean average the reason that we don't say average is because average sort of makes you think of well maybe it's the average of the of the minimum and the maximum velocity but that's not really how it works it's sort of a weighted average since if you think about yeah it's a weighted average according to to the um, according to the area the cross-sectional area through which this flow is going um, maximum I'll say u max is going to be at r This is, darn it, this is at R equals zero, right? And at R equals R naught, it's going to be zero because of the no slip condition. Okay. Um, so I'll come back to this page. Let's kind of put a pin in it for now and let's go to the very, oh, 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 I know, I know. The other thing is if it's fully developed, the other thing that, we can say is that the pressure gradient is just equal to some constant and we do have like a really convenient equation that if you've taken fluids before you've probably seen this um, but it's this equation right here so most of that stuff probably looks really familiar I'm going to rewrite it here so we have and I'm tired of the same let's use green shall we we need some color so p1 minus p2 equals I mean, we've got f so this is a friction factor um, times rho u mean squared times l over 2d so it's just pulling that right off of your equation sheet 
This guy right here is our friction factor. Sometimes we call it the Moody friction factor. Uh, sometimes you call uh, faction, I'm sorry, <laughs> vector. Um, sometimes you see it uh, referred to as the Darcy friction factor. It's the same thing, um, but this is something you can pull off of a Moody chart. And it's super convenient, so we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. So we'll look at it in just a second in the context of a problem. Sound good? I think so. All right. So I'm going to go to problem 10. So we have water at 40 degrees. Let's go ahead and write this. Right, so water at 40 degrees. And we're given some, you know, we're given our rho, we're given uh, our dynamic viscosity. And by the way, like anytime you see, this is, this guy, you have two viscosities. One is a dynamic, one's a kinematic. Um, this one, if you hear somebody say viscosity, that's what they're talking about. Um, yeah. But anyway, so, and then they're related to one another. And let me show you where you can find that on your equation sheet, like that relationship. I had to be kind of, uh, actually, I think it's, I, think I may have put it up at the top somewhere, perhaps, actually. Maybe not. Okay, I think this was one of the ones where you ca I had to kind of be a little bit creative about how I bury the definitions within one another so I can fit everything in. Um, but you can see you can see that the dynamic viscosity, dynamic viscosity divided by the density would get you um, the kinematic viscosity. So it's sort of like, it's sort of buried within there. I don't know, maybe I wrote it somewhere else too, but that's that's where it could be. You can find it, it's buried in there, but it is there. Is it at the top? Thought it might be, for some reason I wasn't seeing it. The top of the equation sheet. Oh, you are correct, look at that, it's right there. Amazing. So oh, it's there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Boy, this needs to be cleaned up, doesn't it? Looks better already. All right. So let's go back to our problem. So we have a mean velocity of three feet per second. And we want to find the pressure drop and then we want to know the power required to overcome that pressure drop so we want to find p1 minus p2 this is going to be by the way this will be a positive this will be a positive value right because you would expect the pressure to go down due to fluid friction on the uh, between the fluid and the wall of that pipe so that will be calculating a positive number. If I calculated P2 minus P1, um, then that would be a uh, negative number. And then I want to find the power that's required to overcome that pressure drop. So we got to maybe use a pump to, to overcome that. And so that's going to be W dot. All right. So one of the things I will assume is that fully developed. So fully developed flow. Um, as far as like, when can you assume that? Um, honestly, I probably should have put that in here. So I'll add that as a line. <laughs> assume fully developed flow. Okay.
Alrighty, so let's go ahead and calculate things. All right. So my P1 minus P2, we know that's equal to our friction factor times, uh, what was it again? There we go. So we have rho, u mean, yeah, there we go. Come on, there we go. So we have rho, u mean squared times L okay. over 2D. Um, and it looks like, okay, so I know rho, that's given to me in the problem statement. I've got the mean velocity, I've got the length. I have the diameter, although I didn't put it in here. I should have probably used a capital D since that's what I've got on the equation sheet, but there you go. Um, I know everything except that friction factor, and that friction factor is going to be pulled from my Moody chart. So let's go look at it and see what information we need to get to use that Moody chart. So here he is. So this is on page seven of your equation sheet. And let's see what's here. So we have um, on the Y axis, you have your friction factor, perfect. On the X axis, we've got a Reynolds number. So that will be important. You notice that if we have laminar flow, that friction factor is just, it's not even something we have to read off of the off of the Moody chart. It's just 64 over our Reynolds number. However, if it's not laminar flow, if we have, um, if we have uh, turbulent flow, then what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to, number one, figure out is it a smooth or a rough pipe? So if it's a smooth pipe, we're gonna be reading along this line, right? Just go to your Reynolds number, Go to your Reynolds number and read off the read off the corresponding friction factor. Um, if your if your pipe had some sort of roughness associated with it, um, you've got this parameter over here, relative roughness. So you've got the roughness normalized to the diameter, um, and there's some values here for kind of sample values for for different types of materials. Um, if you needed that information, you would be given it. Um, there we go. All right. So we need to figure out laminar or turbulent. Okay. So, all right. So I need to figure out what my Reynolds number is and we're not calculating it on a length uh, or based on a length. We're calculating it on according to a diameter. Okay. Um, so our Reynolds number is, it should look, it should look pretty similar. In fact, let's go look. Going back to our equation sheet, let's make sure that we have it. So for circular tubes, this is how we're going to be defining things. So it's not according to a length, it's according to the diameter. That's our characteristic length. All right. So what they've given us, they've given us the density and then they've given us the dynamic viscosity. So I think I'm going to use this, this first one here. So I have rho u mean times our diameter. Rho mean times our diameter over our viscosity. Um, so it's just pretty much a plug and chug, I do believe. Although, no, there are a few little unit conversions. So let's make sure we got it. So I have 62.42 um, pound mass per feet cubed times my mean velocity, three feet per second, uh, yeah, three feet per second, times our diameter, and our diameter is point, 
think this is probably going to be slightly annoying. So I'm going to go ahead and just do the unit conversion one time. So the diameter is 0 0.15 meters. So let's see. Point one five divided by twelve, so it's gonna be zero point zero one two five meter uh I I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not meters. Inches. There we go. Alright. So this is zero point zero one two five feet. Right, got a viscosity down at the bottom, so 3.74, 3.74, and it's pound mass per feet hour. Probably need to reconcile the hours and the seconds, so an hour, 3,600 seconds. That should take care of, yeah, I think that should take care of everything that I need. Um, so this ends up being 1803. All right. So here's where I'm realizing I didn't actually tell you. For a circular pipe, or a pipe, I should say a cylindrical pipe. Not a circular pipe. Or a sink cylindrical pipe or a pipe with a, cir a circular cross-sectional area um, that critical Reynolds number critical is 2300 again Andrew mentioned in the at the beginning that he remembered a value of 2100 some books give it uh, some books will give it as a different number but round 2300 we are in this class we're going to use 2300 and it's on your equation sheet so you don't have to remember so looks like that means that this guy is laminar perfect all right so let's keep on going so that means that that means that if i go to my moody chart i remember that if it's laminar and it's just the friction factor is just 64 over that Reynolds number. Um, if it had been turbulent, I probably would have made the assumption that it was a smooth pipe. I would have gone to the Reynolds number and it's just that bottom line there. And I would have said, OK, there, you know, this is my friction factor. OK. Because I, I don't really have any other information to go on. I don't know what type of material that 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 pipe is made out of. So that would be the best best case or best. Uh, best assumption that I could bake on the given information. All right, so this guy, 64 over my Reynolds number, which I've already calculated, and then times rho times my mean velocity times L over that Reynolds number. Uh, I'm sorry, not the Reynolds number, 2D. There we go. Perfect. All right. Um, I do, I think I do actually. Yeah, I think I do need to show some unit conversions as annoying as it is. It's okay. So I have P1 minus P2, 64 over 1803. Row is 62.42 pound mass per feet cubed. Okay. Times the mean velocity, three feet per second squared, times our length. Our length is, it was given to us in the problem statement, it's 30 feet. Um, and then I've got over two diameters. So diameter we said was in feet, 0 0.0125 feet. Per 
perfect. All right. So this is, it'd be nice if I could get it in like PSI or something like that, right? Something that's uh, in units of some sort of useful units of pressure. So I've got pound mass. That's not pound force. I need pound force. Um, so it's one pound force. 32.174 or thir just 32.2. I want to use 32.174, but pound mass foot per second squared. Perfect. Okay. I think that will work. So that's going to end up getting us um, pound force per feet squared. This ends up being 930 pound force per foot squared. I'm going to assume that if you wanted to, you could convert to PSI pound force per inch squared, but this is, it'll be 6.46 pound force per inch squared or PSI. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll box both of them or put a happy cloud around both of them. So they should be see. I think you have to have to look around for them though. So let's see. Eh. Not exactly as it's written. So let's I tell you what, let's do this. Let's use what's written. See if we can also arrive at the same thing. I just happen to, you know, I, I just happen to know that one. Okay. That one. So let's see if we could do it with what's written there. All right. So this whole thing would be in, I'd have squared. So this would all be So I'd feet cubed on the top. Yeah, so this would should all be, this would be in pound mass. Um, cubed per foot pound, uh, put for put uh, foot second, right? Second squared squared there yeah um, so let's see if we could kind of get it to PSI if we wanted to or pound pound force so uh, not really a clean way to do it Well, Hannah, I think I don't really like the conversion sheet that's got on there. So I think I might add another one just so we have it, because that would sure be helpful if you didn't know that by heart. So actually, I'm going to write it on my hand. <laughs> so I'm going to add another one of those. Yeah, I know. Okay. All right, it's all in my hand. It's gonna happen, okay? 
long as I don't wash my hands between now and the time that I do it. <laughs> so I, I will I will fix it. Yeah, so if we if you need it, I'll have it on the equation sheet. But yeah, I'll I'll add another another page of, of um conversion factors just so you have it. All right. So pretending that those were on there and available to us, let's go ahead and get our our that that's A. And then B is asking for the power. Um, so I'm going to write it as, well, this is M dot times little w. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because you may recall from um, Thermo 1, actually. So pump work. We had a really convenient equation for pump work albeit you did have to make an assumption that it it operates ideally and that would be an assumption that i would that i would probably make here um but this becomes might look familiar v v delta p and actually it was a negative v delta p but Maybe that looks kind of familiar to some of you guys. Reversible steady flow work. So this is reversible steady flow. Um, and I don't really have things, you know, I have a, a specific volume, but I do have density. So maybe I want to do something with that. So this is M dot uh, delta P over rho, right? One over uh, rho is the specific volume. And then I don't think they actually gave me the mass flow rate, <laughs> but you may also recall M dot, this is equal to rho times your velocity times your cross-sectional area. All right. So let's go ahead and put all that in there. It looks like, yeah, looks like I don't really need, yeah, it looks like the rho is going to cancel out. Right, I didn't have mass flow rate, right? That was not given to me. Yeah. Okay. So... Yeah, so now I've got rho times the mean velocity times that cross-sectional area, pi d squared over 4 times, and I'm not going to put it as p2 minus p1. I'm just going to put it as p1 minus p2 because, again, I just want it to be a positive number. I'll report a positive number. I, if I put it in as P2 minus P1, I'm going to end up getting a negative number, which is fine. It just indicates that it's a, a power input, right? I have to provide power. Um, and then on the denominator, I've got rho. And so I can see, well, this rho and this rho are going to cancel out. I probably do have some unit conversions, unfortunately, but it is what it is. So I've got my mean velocity, 3 feet per second. times, all right, so I have a pi d, pi, times my diameter, 0, 0.0, uh, but again, 0 0.012, yeah, there it is, 0 0.0125 meters squared times, uh, let's do the 930 pound force uh, per feet squared. Uh, and then I've, I've got to divide all of this, I guess, by four. Um, and probably I want to put this in terms of like, I don't know, some unit of power off the top of my head. I'm thinking BTUs. On a test, I'll be specific about what unit I want it in. But yeah, we could do that. So let's see. I know one, well, not BTUs, but BTUs per second. So I know uh, one BTU. Again, I don't know. This is on your equation sheet. Not very useful, but 778.17 foot pound force. There we go. And I think that will give us some value 
in BTU per second, right? Because we've got a pound force, actually, let's make that pink. Pound force, pound force. Um, I have this foot and this foot go away. Oh, and I'm seeing it now. Somebody was waiting for me. That's not in meters, that's in feet. Yeah, there we go. So I've got a feet squared over here and then I've got a feet squared right there. So I should be left, I'll be left with BTU per second. Yeah, so whatever that guy is, is our power. Perfect. All right. All right, so we're gonna to go to problem 11, but before we do that, I wanna kind of rewind just a little bit because we started talking about hydrodynamic com um, considerations. We're gonna go back just a hair bit. Doing that. Well, why are you doing that? I'm gonna close you out, don't do that. Oh, maybe it's that. Ah, there we go. I pushed something I wasn't supposed to. So I'm gonna go. Oh well. I'm gonna go to this guy right here. So internal flow. Um, so hydrodynamic considerations, and let's do thermal considerations. So same thing, we got flow through. Uh, what was the final answer? Well, I didn't give it to you, but primarily because I think you can do it. <laughs> Don't want that. Not. I mean, we can get an answer if you want. It's just plug and chug. So we have three times 3.14 times 0 0.0125 times 0 0.0125 times 930 uh, divided by four times 778.17. What do I have? Where is it? That seems rather small. 3 times 3.14 times 0 0.0125 it's not 30 yeah I do have a very small number I have 0 Oops, don't want you stop that 0 0.00 I think there's a third zero there 4 4 yeah something small Okie dokie. So let's let's go on up. Do, do, do. There we go. All right. So thermal considerations. Let's look at those. So again, here's our pipe, and we've got flow through the pipe. So here's our pipe. Um, and what's coming in is going to be at some temperature, I don't know, T infinity, T mean, T mean in, we'll call it, right? Um, and let's move him up. Okay, well, I won't move him up because he's not being, being super annoying. All right. All right. So there's my T mean in. Okay. T mean in. Coming in. And then let's say that the surface of this pipe here is heated. And we're actually going to look at two cases, by the way. We're going to look at two cases. 
First case, case one, is we have a constant surface temperature. So Ts is some constant. Right? Oops. And then our other case, yep, no problem. Our other case, Our other case, case two, is that we have a constant surface heat flux. All right, no problem. All right, but this one, we're just gonna be saying, we're gonna use the example that, okay, we have a constant surface heat flux because it's kind of easier to visualize what's going on. All right, um, so as you can imagine, as that flow comes in, um, as the flow comes in, it's gonna heat up. And the temperature profile is most definitely going to change. Um, so the temperature profile, depending on whether it's heating up or cooling down, you know, if the surface temperature is hotter, it's gonna be, that fluid will be heating up. Um, but the temperature profile will change with respect to X, right? It will definitely change. So we can't do the same thing like with the hydrodynamically fully developed. We can't say it's fully developed if the temperature profile isn't changing, like the velocity profile is not changing, because it definitely will. But we have to define it just a little bit differently. So we say that it is fully developed thermally if, okay, if the derivative, and we're going to define a dimensionless temperature gradient, so it's Ts at some location x minus the temperature of the fluid. So the, 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 the temperature of the fluid, the temperature as a function of r and x. So that's our, our fluid temperature. Maybe I want to put that like that one. That's the surface temperature over, um, over Ts, again, that same Ts as a function of x minus our mean temperature as a function of x. If this guy is equal to zero, then we say it's fully developed. And we use that little equation right there to get some uh, equations for these cases, case one and case two. Um, and those equations are on our equation sheet. So let's go look and see if we can find out where those are. Come on. I'm going to close this out, actually. Hold on just a second. Let me... Sure, just save everything. Okay. Let me open it up again being annoying. Unit four, there we go. There we go. Now it's not annoying. Perfect. Ugh. Grr. All right. Perfect. So I mentioned we've got two cases that we're going to look at. Constant surface temperature and a constant, uh, constant heat flux. And so we've got some equations that we uh, that we can use for either case. 
again, um, we use this, this equation right here to get those equations. Um, and that was covered in the, um, in the video on internal flow. So, okay, perfect. Um, I think the other thing that I will kind of note, we talked about for a flow over a flat plate, how the heat transfer coefficient changes along the length of that. Um, for internal flow, can define a local heat transfer coefficient as well. And if I look at where we have flow that is fully developed, and by the way, that's, you know, um, this guy right here, this location, this is where the flow <laughs> where the flow becomes fully developed thermally. If the flow is fully developed, that local heat transfer coefficient is a constant. But if it's not, it's going to change. So it'll be very high right at the entrance. Um, and then it'll decrease until it gets to a constant value once it becomes fully developed. Um, so where this where this transition occurs, this will, of course, this is going to depend on um, if the flow is laminar or turbulent. And so that'll be something that we need to, to figure out. Okay. I know it's a lot of little kind of, um, a lot of stuff kind of thrown at you. It'll make sense. Basically, it's going to lead us down the decision tree of which equations that we're going to end up using, which empirical relationships are we going to be using. That's it. So let's go back to problem 11. So we have engine oil is heated by flowing through a circular tube with a diameter of 50 millimeters. Perfect. Okay. So let's go ahead and write that in here. Oops. And it's a long pipe. There we go, that's trying to indicate that the length is, keeps on going, right? So this length is 25 meters. The diameter D is 50 me uh, millimeters, so 0 0.05 meters. Um, and it's maintained at a constant surface temperature so this is case one, constant surface temperature of 150 degrees Celsius. So again, it's case one that we talked about. Um, and then what's come in and again is oil. And it's coming in. So it's coming in. I've got a mass flow rate of 0 0.5 kilograms per second. And then uh, temperature, so this is the mean temperature at the inlet, and this is 20 degrees Celsius. And we want to find the mean temperature at the outlet, whatever that may be. And then we want to also find the total heat transferred through the tube. Um, so what we're going to be looking for is just the, the total tr heat transfer, really the rate. Um, Although that should, it should say that. Um, and we're going to say we want it in watts. Okay. Right. So first things first. Mean temperature at the outlet. 
and then also we want the total Q rate for this whole darn thing here. Okay, perfect. So let's see what else we've got. Um, let's go back over here. All right, so let's look at the equations that we might be able to use if the surface temperature is constant. So it looks like I've got an equation for Q over here that might be useful for case uh, for for part B. Um, this this guy depends on a long B, long log mean temperature. And that temperature, log mean temperature, is defined right there. Um, and then the little delta T's are defined over here. So it's just, it's kind of an annoying little, um, little parameter, but it's 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 just a plug and chug kind of thing. So all of these guys are related to this guy. I don't really need the Q yet, but what I do need, I need uh, the temperature at the outlet. So that's going to be this guy right here, right? The mean temperature at a particular location X. So, okay, let's go, go get that. All right. So constant, a constant surface temperature. So the equation that we're going to use, we have TS minus the mean temperature at the outlet over, um, then I have the surface temperature minus, and it's the mean temperature at the inlet. So again, this guy right here, this is the the TM on your equation sheet, that's the TM at some particular location X, and this is at X equals zero. Okay. And then I know that this is equal to, well, I could plug in some numbers for this guy right now, couldn't I? So this is 150 degrees Celsius, 150 degrees Celsius right here as well. And then this is the mean temperature at the outlet that I'm supposed to find. And then this is the 20 degrees Celsius right here. Perfect. All right. And then I know that this is equal to E to the negative. And then there's, it says a perimeter times X. And the X in this case is the X that Right, the x, the location that I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in the right at at this location right here at x equals l. So it's l. Um, so the perimeter times the length times x equals l um, times, and I'm going to put this guy. Actually, I'll put him in purple. I think. You know, not feeling that. I'm going to do green. Changed my mind. Let's do green. Times h bar. Okay. Uh, divided by my m dot times vp. All right, I am clearly going to need some some values here. Um, again, typically I'm going to give you these values. Um, best thing to do would be to for these guys evaluate your properties at the average mean temperature. Right, T M N. My, uh, right, uh, between T mean at the inlet and the outlet get the average. We don't know me the mean temperature at the at the outlet. So I'd probably just do it at, you know, the average of 20 and 150 and call that good. Um, but just say that I was that I gave you these properties. So for oil, you can get properties. So we've got Rho is equal to 852 kilograms per meter cubed. Kinematic viscosity, 37.5 times 10 to the negative 6 uh, meters squared per second 
We also have, when we're going to need it, <laughs> I think we'll need it, our thermal conductivity of our fluid, of our oil, is 0.138 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, we also have a Prandtl number that's going to be pretty darn high. Is that uh, a CP oh. or a C times rho? Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's a CP. So 490. Yeah. So you can leave off the CP. We can leave it off if it, you know, if it bothers you to have it there. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I could see how that would be confusing. So maybe I'll, well, if it lets me de delete it, that would be cool. Yeah. So I'll just, no, just stop that. All right. Well, whatever. I'll leave it there. It's meant to be. So 2131, 2131, and it's joules per kilogram K. All right. So the next thing that I need to do, it looks like, yeah, it looks like I have, I have everything here, right? I, you know, my perimeter, the perimeter would just be pi d l. I got a length, no, not pi d l, it's just pi d, um, times the length, times that h bar. Um, do I have any M dot? I do have an M dot. That's nice. M dot. And then I got a CP. All right, there we go. So clearly I know everything except I don't have the mean temperature at the outlet and I don't have H bar. Um, so I've got one equation and one unknown need something else. So I do need to find that H bar. All right. So, and I know that that average H bar is going to be, well, it's going to be equal to my average new salt number. Average new salt number um, for an internal, for internal flow, we'll put like a subscript D uh, times the thermal conductivity of our fluid divided by the diameter. Right, and we need to do that because we have these empirical relationships for non-dimensionalized heat transfer coefficients for the Nusselt number, right? So the Nusselt number is the non-dimensionalized heat transfer coefficient. All right, perfect. Well, to figure out that Nusselt number, I need to ask myself two things. Number one, is it laminar? So here's my decision tree. Is it laminar or is it turbulent? So I can get my Reynolds number here. So my Reynolds number for internal flow. So this is mean velocity times the diameter over my dynamic viscosity. So I've got all of those things. Ooh, I don't have all of those things actually. Um, I do need my, because uh, I don't have, if you look up at what was given to us, we have an M dot. But we don't actually have the mean velocity, but that's okay. So I can I know that m dot it's rho times the velocity times my cross sectional area, right? And so well that means that this is going to be m dot uh, divided by rho times the cross-sectional area, which is pi d squared over four. So maybe I put the four up here. All right, so now this becomes, so this will be four m dot d. And I'll have that uh, kinematic viscosity. Then I'll have a row and then a pi d squared. I guess it, maybe it might simplify just like a tidy bit because I can at least get rid of one of those diameters, but yeah, not really. Um, so I end up getting a value of 398. Um, so that tells me it's laminar. Laminar because 
because our Reynolds number is less than that critical Reynolds number of 2300 for internal flow. All right. Where check did the, the four come from? The four? Uh, oh, because it's uh, the cross sectional area. So pi d squared over four. Um, and I just put that four up at the top. So cross-sectional area, pi d squared over four. Okay. All right, so I've answered the question of laminar or turbulent flow. It's laminar, great. But now I have to figure out, is it fully developed? And I'll need to figure out, is it fully developed thermally and hydrodynamically? So is the flow fully developed? Thermally, actually we'll do hydrodynamically first. All right, so that's fine. Let's do that. So we're trying to find, okay, well, this thing is, this thing is uh, 25 meters long, right? That's the length of my pipe. And so is it fully developed? Um, by the time we get to L and really we're real I mean what we're really we're looking for an average H bar so what I'd be thinking is okay is 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 the flow mostly within that developing region or does that occur pretty pretty early on so let's calculate this guy right so it's going to be up here. So I know it's laminar flow. So this is the equation I'm going to use to see when that transition happens. So 0 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the diameter. So 0 0.05 times our Reynolds number, which we've got to be 398, times our diameter, which is 0 0.05 meters. So this guy is just, it's just plug and chug. Um, so I get... something. Why don't I have that number? I don't have it written in front of me, but that's okay. I can calculate that, can't I? So this is going to be 0 0.05 times our Reynolds number, uh, 398 times our diameter 0 0.05. So I've got 0 0.995. 0 0.995 five meters so it it it's it it uh develops right at, at about one meter and then for the rest of that 24 meters it's fully developed so great so all right so that's just helping leading me down the decision tree when i get there of which equation to use and then i need to figure out is it developed thermally All right, so going back to my equation sheet, and I know for laminar flow, it's going to be that equation right there. So uh, point, there we go, point zero 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the diameter times the Prandtl number. So, oops. 0 0.05 times our Reynolds number. Actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, times our Reynolds number, times our diameter, times the Prandtl number. So if you recall, that Prandtl number was pretty big, um, three, no, 490. Um, and so I get a value of uh -oh, 486 meters. So why we could say Yes, it's fully developed hydrodynamically, thermally, no. Okay. So this is what we would call mixed conditions. 
right? It's fully developed hydrodynamically, but not thermally. So now let's go to our equation sheet and see if we can get um, an equation for our new silt number. Okay. So based on what we found, oops, and I think that probably you can't see that on what we found for those two things, one and two. Let's figure out what our new sold number is going to be. So average new sold number. So let's go look. Let's look at our equation sheet. Right. Uh, pass that Moody factor. Actually, external flow. Where's our internal flow? Oh, I just went right past it. I'm sorry. All right, so here we go. So this is table 8.4. This is page six of that heat transfer. How do you know it's not thermally fully developed? Because our pipe, yeah, our pipe is 25 meters long and it will take 486 meters for it to become fully thermally developed. Yeah. All right, so laminar flow, but it's not fully developed. So, yeah, it's not going to be, not going to be this guy, not going to be this guy. That's not fully, we're not fully developed. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, okay, this next one might be a possibility. So, laminar flow. Uh, we're still in the thermal entry region or combined entry. Uh, so, mixed conditions, but combined entry with a parental number of greater than and we have a uniform temperature and unfortunately it's kind of ugly they do define GZ so that's the greats number uh, G-R-A-E uh, T-Z but they give the definition right here all right so that's the equation for us we've gone down the decision tree and we've got the appropriate equation here for us so perfect all right so this ends up being 3.66 plus 0 0.0668 times our greats number. And there's a little subscript deed there over 1 plus 0 0.04 times our greats number, subscript D. Um, and it's to the two thirds, so two thirds, two raised to the two thirds. Um, I'll just say where that greats number, it's defined as D over L times our Reynolds number times our Prandtl number. And we have all that information. So I end up getting, this guy ends up being 390. It's dimensionless. And so now I can plug that into here and I can get in a final equation for our new salt number. I end up getting 11.95. Again, it's a dimensionless parameter, so there's no units there. Um, and let's see. So now I'm ready to plug things in. I'm gonna plug it back in, okay. And so from here, I'm gonna get an H bar of 33 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And now, <laughs> now I can plug that in here. And so I can, I can finally solve. I can solve for that mean temperature at the outlet, which is what I was looking for, for in the first place. I'm going to try to zoom in just a tiny bit. I end up getting 35 degrees. Perfect. So that's my answer for part A. And then we'll work B and then we'll be done for the night because that's as far as we got with the class this morning. Okay. 
So that's A. And again, B is asking us for the heat transfer rate for the whole tube. So, okay. I think we can make it here. So let's zoom in on here. So for B, want to find Q. And we really have two options. If you remember our equation sheet, there actually was an equation for Q if you had a constant surface temperature. So that's your first option. And you can use that log mean temperature difference if you want to. So we would use that your Q is equal to H bar times your surface area times your log mean oops, log mean temperature. So there's a, like a little delta and a T L M. That's the log mean temperature. And it's defined on your equation sheet right there. It's that whole thing right there. That surface area is just going to be pi dl. So put this as h bar, which again, you've gotten that h bar. You've got him. That's the 33 watts per meter squared Kelvin that we just went through a lot of trouble to solve um, times pi dl times that log mean temperature difference. So you could do that, no problem. You could also, and we'll use option two. I would encourage you also try it out, option one, just to make sure that you get, um, you get the same answer or something pretty darn close. Um, but, you know, use an energy balance in the form of your first law. So first law of thermo applied to the oil. And that oil is flowing through through one end and exiting on the outlet or on the other end at 25 meters and it's an open system. And so your equation uh, your first law is DE DT equals Q dot minus W dot plus I'm writing it in the form, you know, Q dot as in like, this is what you would have remembered that first law looking like um, times, all right, M dot times H plus the kinetic energy, oops, kinetic energy plus the potential energy stuff at the inlet minus the same thing at the outlet. Okay. So there's the inlet and the outlet. Um, and then, you know, you can ignore, oops, you can probably ignore the potential energy change and the kinetic energy change from the inlet to the outlet. You can probably say it's steady state. You don't have any power generated or required within that control volume from x equals zero to x equals 25 meters. Um, and so what you're gonna get, and then I would also just say this is Q, you're gonna get Q is equal to, got one inlet, one outlet, M dot times delta H, which we would say is M dot times CP delta T, where that delta T is the delta T of your fluid, right? right mean temperature at the outlet minus the mean temperature at the inlet we already solved for that mean temperature at the outlet that was our 35 degrees celsius um, and so for this guy we could just it's just a plug and chug we've got the cp we've got m dot m dot was given to us and this ends up being 15,980 watts perfect and that's it. And that's the answer for B. And again, you can absolutely, I would encourage you to try things out with that first equation there, the one that's on your equation sheet. But I just wanted to kind of show that it all works together, right? You can use stuff that you previously used in other classes if it still applies.
All right, so next time we meet, we'll work those last three problems and then we'll be ready for radiation and heat exchangers and then we'll be done. So, all right, thank you guys very much. If you have questions, I'll hang out for a little bit. For the time being, I will just put on my timer. But again, if you have questions, just pipe up.